It's Monday, June 13th. It's the biggest deal in 30 years, but the bar for that is kind of low. We start here. A bipartisan group of senators reaches a handshake agreement on guns. Devil's in the details, but it looks like this stands a pretty good chance. We'll talk about what is and isn't included here. Police say a Pride event was almost under attack. White supremacist groups are anti-LGBTQ people. But a group of white supremacists was allegedly plotting, and the most conservative Supreme Court in years prepares to issue some of its most consequential decisions yet. To have so many with just a couple weeks left to go uh, is a sign of just how embattled the Supreme Court is. We'll ask our court watcher what we should all be ready for. From ABC News, this is Start Here. I'm Brad Milkey. In the last 10 years, some of the most influential voices on gun policy in this country have actually been the parents of victims, especially the parents of the victims at Sandy Hook Elementary School in Newtown, Connecticut. And of course, it would make sense it would be the parents to speak out, right? Their children are not like the high schoolers from Parkland, Florida. The ones who survived in Newtown were six and seven years old at the time. Even today, they are younger than many of the Parkland kids. And so for 10 years, many of the witnesses of this nation's deadliest elementary school shooting has stayed silent. That changed this weekend when several students came forward to ABC's Martha Raddatz for the first time. I was towards the front near the door and I remember thinking, if someone comes in our classroom, like I'm gonna be first, I'm not gonna make it out. Out of respect for their privacy, we are only using their first names. That was Nicole, this is Andrew. I couldn't get the sounds out of my head during the night. I couldn't close my eyes without reliving it. And lost in the conversation about the police response in Uvalde, Texas recently, is how quickly assault rifles can kill scores of people. It was just pure devastation and loss. Maggie described how at Sandy Hook, it took only four and a half minutes to kill 26 people, 20 of them children. And I didn't know that those sounds I was listening to was my friend being murdered. And one of the famous images of that shooting was after all the gunfire of first graders being evacuated. One of those students, Jackie, told Martha about the moment they were told to grab onto the child in front of them, close their eyes, and walk past the bodies. There was glass and obviously blood, and I didn't want to step on anything. So I did, I did open my eyes. Um, That's a thought that probably does not go away. No. But all these students agreed that if the average American had seen what they'd seen, they would have no problem passing stricter gun laws. It just really broke me to know that after 10 years of everyone giving us their thoughts and prayers and, you know, after 10 years of everyone saying enough is enough and never again after Sandy Hook, it happened again. Hold up your sign and say, this time is different. This weekend, some of those students from Sandy Hook went to Washington, D.C. to join the other members of this horrific club, children who have survived a mass shooting. You say Children are the future, and you never listen to what we say once we're old enough to d disagree with you, you decaying degenerates. Tens of thousands joined the so-called March for Our Lives. Many people spoke, but perhaps the moment that spoke the loudest was when a loud noise went off, someone said the word gun, and people in the crowd started panicking. We fight every day for our... <laughs> Nothing turned out to be wrong, but several of these young people were visibly shaken, crying, the trauma sticking with them, including some of the survivors from Sandy Hook. That was Saturday. Well, yesterday morning on Sunday, we learned that U.S. senators have done something they have not done in nearly 30 years. They came to a bipartisan agreement on a new package of gun laws. Let's go straight to ABC's Capitol Hill producer, Trish Turner, this morning, who's been following these negotiations as they've been unfolding. And Trish, this was a framework, right? It's not a finished bill. How big of a deal is it, though? Brad, this is a really big deal. First time, like you said, since the 1990s that we've seen major revisions in gun safety laws. Uh, it has 10 Republicans on board. Now, they were really clear. One Republican aide told me specifically, look, we haven't finished all the legislative detail. This is all the sausage that gets put into a bill. They've got to write legislative text. They've got to look at funding levels. So we've got a long way to go. But uh, we'll see how this turns out. What's in the deal? Like, what, what are the most important provisions here we should know about? 
Right. Um, so the first is uh, these are federal incentives for states to implement red flag laws. So right now, 19 states have these so-called red flag laws. It's basically getting a court order to temporarily seize the guns of someone that's uh, presumed to be a danger or found to be a danger. So those are red flag laws, funding incentives for states to do it. That's very important for Republicans. This isn't a federal mandate. I was going to say, um, there's a difference between saying everyone has a red flag law from now on and will help you right. if you want to create a red flag law. That's right. They're going to make they're going to give them strong um, financial incentives to do it, but they're not going to mandate it from the federal level. There are Republicans who think that's just not constitutional. Um, and then the second really big one in this one is enhanced background checks. And they're in a number of areas. The biggest one that really was kind of a surprise to us is closing the so-called boyfriend loophole. So they're going to ban gun ownership for all those people who've been convicted of domestic violence. And that's beyond spouses. So these are like intimate partners. Uh, they're, they're for the boyfriend um, uh, loophole name. So, so there's that. They also were Senators really on both sides of the aisle have grappled with this one. It'll be interesting how the language comes out, but they are really looking at putting juvenile records um, into the background check system so that when 18 to 20 year olds, 21 year olds go to buy an assault style rifle, the the really serious crimes in their juvenile records will be seen by those background check analysts. Wait, that so, wasn't already um, a thing, Trish? If somebody was 16 years old and committed a violent crime, that wouldn't have shown up on your gun purchase? It's so crazy to think about this, but assault-style rifles really came along later. 18-year-olds can go, can't go, can buy a handgun, but they can buy an AR-15, as we've seen. Huh. Then they're going to put in money, federal money, for mental health, for children and families, uh, for school security. Um, and, and so, you know, this is a pretty big package, and it's going to take time for them to really hammer out the legislative text because it, it's a cliche, but it's really true here. The devil is in the details. Right. And so, you know, we've seen bills passed in the House. They didn't have the Senate support. In the Senate, you need the, the 60 votes. So are we talking about like, this is about to be a 60-40 thing where one Republican senator could hold this up or – is this really a bipartisan, like, 90 to 10 style bill? I think, uh, Brad, I think it has a chance of getting around 70 senators wow. total. So, like, around 20 Republicans. We've talked to a number. There are a number who are up for re-election. This makes them really nervous. Step one is to try to get a deal. As I've said repeatedly, I hope that'll be sooner rather than later. But the really big deal, Mitch McConnell came out in support of the status of the talks. He wants them to keep moving forward. Some people will not want to touch this with a 10-foot pole um, because they're concerned about the politics of it. But I think this is a, a time where hopefully uh, we can transcend that. I don't see a whole lot here that would really scare a lot of Republicans away. The only thing I can be honest with you that I think might be troublesome for some Republicans is the funding levels. It's going to be billions of taxpayer dollars at a time when inflation is at record high. If they don't find a way to offset that with some kind of spending cuts, I can see Republicans having trouble with that more so more so than the actual legislation itself. Well, so then, Trish, I mean, you said more background checks for 18 year olds, you know, but I didn't hear you say age limits. We talked about red flag laws, but we didn't talk about not letting people buy AR-15s full stop. Right. So what are the things that are not going to be in this framework? And because of those omissions, would this even be effective? Yeah, it's hard to say its effectiveness. I mean, but I will say it is certainly not the dream list um, that a lot of Democrats and gun safety advocates really want. And the president, for that matter, we should say. You can be 18 years old and buy an assault weapon, even though you can't buy a pistol in Texas until you're 21. So it's not raising the age from 18 to 21 to buy these assault style rifles like an AR-15. It's not the full assault weapon span that expired in the 90s that President Biden was a part of. Right. Um, and it's not universal background checks for all commercial sales. That failed in the Senate already. It was too heavy a lift behind the scenes um, in the past month when they've been negotiating. So that's not going to happen either and certainly not going to happen for private sales. Republicans really think that's a domain that's strictly verboten. So it, it definitely falls short of what activists really want, those that are advocating for, you know, gun safety reform. Parkland school shooting survivor David Hogg went door to door on Capitol Hill pleading for reform. It's, look, it's more looking at this as the first step and not the last step. 
But a number of activists like Gabby Giffords, um, Congre former congresswoman who was nearly killed by a shooter, the Sandy Hook survivors, Parkland survivors, these guys have all turned into major activists, both the children and the parents. They all came out with statements, you know, supporting what this, what these senators are going to do. And it certainly sounds like the House Speaker, Nancy Pelosi, is on board with this too, at least so far. So everyone is moving in the same direction. It looks like it would eventually pass Congress. We'll see. Again, devil's in the details, but it looks like this stands a pretty good chance. All right, that is Trish Turner, our Capitol Hill producer. People always say if you want to know like what's actually being traded back and forth on the Hill, you go to Trish. Thank you so much for the insight. Thanks, Brad. Next up on Start Here, did a Pride Month event just become a target for white supremacists? We're back in a bit. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast. Now streaming on ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Elizabeth Holmes found guilty on four counts of fraud, facing the possibility of decades in prison. Now, we take you inside the courtroom and behind the scenes. The Dropout, Elizabeth Holmes on Trial. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. ABC News, America's number one news source. This, of course, is Pride Month, and several cities around the country were holding events this weekend to celebrate LGBTQ Americans. Not just big cities, either, but mid-sized cities like Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Well, as this big event began in Idaho, called Pride in the Park, authorities got a tip about a suspicious vehicle, a large U-Haul moving van. And inside that U-Haul, they found more than 30 people. All those people, police say, are white supremacists who were planning on starting a riot. ABC's chief investigative reporter Josh Margolin is with us. And Josh, can you just walk me through this arrest? This sounded disturbing. It's very disturbing, Brad, and it's really just as you laid out. These people were arrested after the local police got a tip from somebody who said that there are people look like military type people. We received a telephone call from a concerned citizen who reported that Approximately 20 people jumped into a U-Haul wearing masks. They had shields and, quote, looked like a little army. They were all dressed similarly. They all had equipment. They, they had masks uh, when the police got to them. And the police noted that they seemed to have been organized and planned out. And they actually found some written memo laying out plans. And they were all arrested on charges that they were planning to bring down some sort of a riot or, or violent act at this Pride event. The police reported that these people are connected with a far-right organization called the Patriot Front. This is a, a white nationalist group. They subscribe to an ideology of wanting the United States to be at its core, what they believe it was and always should be, an all-white nation. 
but this is a group much the way that we saw in 2017 at the Charlottesville Unite the Right rally. A lot of these people who lead the Patriot Front were people who were there back in 2017. Well, and they were charged with misdemeanors, but the misdemeanor is like conspiracy to start a riot. We saw their outfits, we saw their weaponry, we saw them getting arrested, but I mean, starting a riot, what does that actually mean? Do we have a sense of what the plan would have allegedly been? It's not entirely clear right now what the plan is, and I don't want to, you know, take it f past where police have been comfortable saying it. The police are continuing their investigation. It's entirely possible, although not guaranteed, that there could be additional charges. But notably, Brad, the police chief on Saturday evening when he announced these charges and these arrests. We have individuals from Texas, Utah, Idaho, Colorado, South Dakota, he noted that it was key that he these people were taken off the street before they could commit an act of violence, so it was proactive. Um, so preventing a riot by arresting 31 people with a misdemeanor, I will gladly do that every day of the week. Uh, these people are from all over. The police department was reacting to what police agencies all over the country are now dealing with. There is a heightened alert because June is Pride Month and because uh, far right and white nationalist and white supremacist groups are anti-LGBTQ people and their events, police are on guard because they don't want to risk one of these public rallies, marches, events being interrupted and possibly people getting hurt. Well, and can I ask a basic question, Josh? Because I hear white supremacist group, I expect them to target events that center around race. And like a pride event in Idaho, I'm looking at the website, the organizers of this pride event right now, they're mostly white people. So can you just help me understand what authorities are seeing here? Why was this going to be a target? It's important to understand, and it's, it's something that white nationalist, white power groups like to force people to confuse. They use language, they use public relations, gimmickry in order to get people to not fully understand what they are all about. But let's just be very, very clear. A white supremacist, a white nationalist, a white power group, they are opposed to black people, they are opposed to Jewish people, they are opposed to LGBTQ, they are opposed to immigrants, they are opposed to everybody and anybody that they perceive is going to move the country away from what they believe the core of the country is, all white America. Right, and to your point about the aims of these groups, I mean, on the shirts of the men who were being arrested, there was a slogan, Reclaim America. Please say, preventing a really scary incident there in Idaho. Josh Margolin, thank you. Thanks, Brad. This morning, the U.S. Supreme Court is set to release some of its decisions for this term. Now, we don't know which cases they will address or how many. What we do know is that theoretically, this court usually has a couple weeks more to wrap up its work before its usual summer break. And it has a ton of decisions still outstanding. So people who watch the court have been saying, buckle up, because there's just an avalanche of cases about to be settled here. One of those people is ABC's own senior Washington reporter, Devin Dwyer. He's our Supreme Court Sherpa. And Devin, I know every week people are asking you, like, is this the week that the big abortion decision comes out? But the truth here sounds like there's several big cases that could by themselves reshape national laws, right? 29 cases are left on the docket, Brad, and it's really an unprecedented uh, load this late in the term. Traditionally, as you know, the court likes to wrap up business by the end of June. They get off to their summer vacations, speaking engagements. Some of them teach college classes. Uh, so to have so many with just a couple weeks left to go uh, is a sign of just how embattled this Supreme Court is. <laughs> Remember the building itself wrapped in that eight-foot security fence. There have been threats against the justices. We know there was that remarkable leak of a draft opinion in the abortion case, which Justice Clarence Thomas came out and said has really destroyed trust on the inside. Clearly now with that investigation underway, you know, backs are up. You begin to look over your shoulder. It's like kind of an infidelity. Um, that you can explain it, but you can't undo it. They're looking, you know, behind themselves and trying to work things out in a totally new, tense environment. Um, and there are a lot of big ticket items on the docket besides abortion, Brad. Um, you talk about the gun case that, that we're waiting for, the most significant case in over a decade. I travel to and from my job at night, sometimes late, sometimes early in the morning, and that I just felt that it wouldn't, make me feel safe. 
is there a fundamental right to carry a handgun for self-defense in public? The Supreme Court a few years ago said you can have a gun in your home for self-defense, but what about outside on the streets? The Second Amendment does not end at your doorstep. A huge oh. test of concealed carry permitting laws uh, in states around the country, specifically coming from the state of New York and eight other states uh, where gun owners have to show a special purpose, a good cause in order to get that permit. A lot on the line there, particularly particularly in light of those mass shootings uh, that have really rocked the country in the past month. Yeah, wait, Devin, on the on the guns issue, I'm trying to get us, because I feel like this could take a lot of people around the country who haven't been paying attention, like very off guard, because I live in New York City, right? Some of the strictest gun laws in the country. But if the justices rule on this today, could guns theoretically be allowed, I'm thinking like on the street or like in the New York City subway in the coming days? How far could this go? No question it's one of the most consequential Second Amendment cases in our history. Uh, there aren't a lot of them, and so this is clearly going to be a big one, Brad. Uh, and it could be sweeping. It would have ripple effects across other places that have similar regimes. And it would mean that you could expect more people to be carrying handguns in places like New York City, Boston, and Los Angeles. You talk to gun safety advocates, and their nightmare scenario is that the court calls into question all permitting requirements uh, for the carry of handguns. Doesn't seem likely that the court is going to go that way. They could. Uh, but even a more moderate decision, one that questions New York's po proper cause requirement, this rule that you, uh, any citizen who wants to carry a loaded, uh, concealed handgun on the streets has to show a special need need for it, um, you know, and, and the state would exercise some discretion in deciding whether you could have it, uh, rolling that requirement back would mean more guns on the streets in uh, in eight states, including New York, home to 80 million Americans, uh, really a dramatic impact. Now, you mentioned those, you know, location requirements and restrictions. Those, as we understand it, would likely still stay in place. But a court decision in this case, which is imminent, uh, could open the door to more legal challenges uh, of gun laws across the country, including those sensitive place uh, regulations. Right. These so-called sensitive places have been, you know, schools and churches and the subway. But this really all could be in the Supreme Court's hands. What other cases do you have your eyes on, Devin? Well, another huge one, Brad, is is a climate case, if you will. It's a challenge to the EPA's authority to regulate greenhouse gas emissions from power plants. Uh, it's a complicated and technical case with huge uh, implications for the fight against climate change. It has incredible um, potential to affect how EPA and other agencies write regulations for years to come. Just how far can the EPA go uh, in, in telling these power plants they have to change their, their infrastructure to meet uh, those demands? Could decide whether the Biden administration can meet its goal of cutting greenhouse gases in half in the next decade, Brad. There's also this case uh, involving school prayer. Uh, a football coach uh, out of Bremerton, Washington, uh, prayed at the 50-yard line with his public school football uh, player after the game, a decision in this case could decide whether public school teachers, public school coaches can pray and exercise their religion within view of students uh, on public schools across the country. And then there's an immigration case, Brad, that everyone has their eye on. It is a challenge uh, to the Biden administration's decision to end Donald Trump's remain in Mexico policy. That was that, um, that rule that uh, the Trump administration put into place to keep those asylum seekers south of the border waiting in Mexico. They will not be allowed to enter the United States. They will be removed and they will be sent back to their country of origin. A controversial topic because so many of those migrants were exposed to violence uh, and, and really treacherous conditions there. No access to legal aid while they waited potentially years to get their asylum claims heard. Uh, the Biden administration wanted to end that policy. They were challenged by Texas and a number of states. Uh, we'll see if the Supreme Court sides with the president here and allows him uh, to move in a different direction. So a lot on the line, Brad, with just a couple of weeks to go. You called it an avalanche, I think, at the top. It certainly feels like we're about to get hit by one. All right, Devin Dwyer covering the Supreme Court, the busiest Supreme Court we've seen in a while. Thanks so much. Thanks, Brad. And one last thing. 
Well, it's happened. Gas prices have hit $5 a gallon on average, according to AAA, just as the peak of summer driving season has arrived. There will be more demand for, for gasoline, more demand for oil. That will cause additional upward pressure, like it does every year, but now it's on top of uh, already high prices. Experts attribute this surge to the war in Ukraine and general inflation since the pandemic began. But if driving takes a bigger toll now than ever, could this pain at the pump cause the death of road trips as we know them. If it gets a seven, I'm stopping. I'm, I'm jumping on a bike or catching a cab or something. Recently, the firm Auto Pacific asked drivers about their summer road trip plans. They didn't find a huge drop off in interest, but they did find people limiting their expectations. Shorter distances, fewer expenditures. We have a lap of Lake Michigan coming up. It's a, a car tour, and we're questioning on whether or not we're going to actually go through with that because that's going to be a few tanks of gas. Remember, five bucks a gallon has ripple effects down the line. If fewer people show up to the gas station, the restaurant at that exit sees fewer customers. And with rising inflation, even if you make it to a tourist destination, you might not want to spend the extra money on a t-shirt or a souvenir. It was uh, $6.39 and it's cost me $75.45. That's a lot of money. It's almost 100 bucks for a little van like this. Some vacation towns say they're seeing more traffic at local pubs and lunch spots and dollar stores instead of the fancy restaurants meant for tourists. Bare necessities only, gas being the most basic among them. And all this creates a concern that even if road trips continue, what we think of as an average road trip might be limited to Americans who are more affluent than average. And whether or not you plan on trading in your station wagon for a staycation, AAA recommends a slow ride, as you tend to get better gas mileage when you go under 50 miles an hour. Keep it under 50. Try telling that to the family with a cranky kid in the back on the way home. Like, I will turn this podcast around if you suggest that again, AAA. Hey, those blockbuster January 6th hearings from last week, that was only the beginning. There is another set of hearings later today. It will be live on abcnews.com, ABC News Radio affiliates, ABC Television, and the ABC News app. I'm Brad Milkey. See you tomorrow.